You're listening to the Awards Watch Podcast. Today I'm talking to Tick Tick Boom star Robin De Jesus. Throughout our 30-minute conversation, the actor gets candid about his well-being and mental health during the shooting of the film, his on-screen co-star Andrew Garfield, the state of representation for queer and Latino actors, and what representation means to him, and much, much more. Hello there. Hello. How's it going? Good. How are you, Robin? I'm well, thank you yourself. I am doing going, pretty Eric? good. I'm good, doing pretty good. good. Glad to hear. Excited. I'm I'm really excited to talk to you. I'm have been a fan for quite some time. And so I'm just really excited to talk to you. Thank you. I I, I appreciate that. Uh well, I mean, first I want to say congratulations on the response to the film because it has been incredible. And congratulations on your Hollywood Critics Association satellite nominations. <laughs> Thank you. It's kind. Of, it, it feels really cool. If I, I'm not gonna lie, I kind of nerd out when someone mentions it. So thank you. Good. You should nerd out. I mean, this is awards watch. This is the perfect place to nerd out about stuff like this. Mm. True that. True that. <laughs> noted. Noted. Um. I want to start a little bit at the beginning. How did little Robin from Connecticut discover theater and that it would be the path that he would eventually take? Hmm. You know, when I was a kid, I loved to sing. I, I, I love the idea of music. Um, I, my family, we're Puerto Rican. We grew up in Connecticut and there was always culturally, there was this idea of um, we only came to Connecticut to be able to afford to build a house in Puerto Rico and and eventually each family that came would go back. That was the goal. And so one of the ways that we stayed connected to Puerto Rico was uh, Christmas time. We 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 do what we call parrandas, which are like the Puerto Rican version of Christmas caroling. Oh, cool. And, and it's very different. Like the concept of it, it's, it's, it's actually cooler. It's like a family uh, will play instruments and sing Christmas carols and they'll go knock on a, on a, a neighbor's house or a relative or whoever. And they'll knock on the door, sometimes unannounced, oftentimes, not always announced. And you surprise them with music. And then that family joins your family and you go to the next family and so on. And so as the night progresses, the group gets bigger and bigger. And we would do this as a kid till like six in the morning. It was an all night thing and it, and it was amazing. And, and so like there was something really cool about watching my, my uncles and, and my aunts and my relatives, you know, the rest of the year, they sort of identified as being like, factory workers but during that time of year it was like they were musicians you know that's great and, and yeah and and so I, I had that always got me involved and I wanted to sing but my voice wasn't good puberty was what changed that when by the time I got to middle school it suddenly clicked and I could uh match pitch what felt like magically <laughs> and when I discovered singing that music just really took over my life and it was the first thing that competed with the idea of going back to Puerto Rico. Oh, okay, wow. And that was huge for me as a kid because that the thing that we had been shaped to accomplish was the thing that now challenged this newfound love. And and the reason that it became a love was because I didn't I didn't really have a thing or a passion as a kid. And uh, my first musical ever was the summer before my freshman year of high school. I'd been singing a couple of years already, but I, I was kind of like, I was hearing about this theater thing and I didn't really understand it. I hadn't, I'd watched a few musicals, but not many. And this kid from my, from my middle school said, Noel Senna is his name. And Noel said, yo, you should audition for this production of Grease. They're doing the next town over. And the next town over is Darien, Connecticut, which is a pretty bougie town in comparison to my like factory working class town or what it was then because it's very gentrified now mm -hmm. and okay to wrap this story up because it's getting it's getting long um <laughs> no one said audition for this show and I was like yeah and there was a cultural divide there were kids that made fun of me but what was really interesting was that this this new thing musical theater that I was discovering kind of overshadowed the bullying and and I, that freshman year or the summer before my freshman year I was conscious enough to clock, oh, like those bougie folks are making fun of me, 
but I don't care because I'm living my life. Exactly. And that's when, that's when I knew theater and acting was it for me. That's incredible. I love that. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, I could sit and talk about camp like all day long because <laughs> I am such a camp queen. I, it's, it's where I discovered you and I, I watch it at least once a year. I, mm-hmm. I adore it. I love it. And so there was like two years between that film and then you going to In the Heights. Did that feel like, did it feel really fast or was that like a long no. two years? No, it felt <laughs> terrible. It was, no, I mean, I mean, in, in retrospect, it was good for me. I think I needed the humility because camp was my first audition. Yeah. And, you know, that it, it, it was interesting because while it gave me a level of, of confidence, it was also the first time that I didn't feel like I was the fiercest person in the room. <laughs> and I think coming in from high school, you kind of like, you know, I'm the shit. I know what I'm doing. And then you, all of a sudden I booked this thing and I was like, oh, shoot, everyone's fierce. And like, you know, how do I navigate that? And, and it was my first time experiencing that. And I'm not a very competitive person. Um, but but it, it, it was interesting because it did it did kind of um, make me like a little self-conscious for a moment. But but then when the movie went to Sundance and we received all that love, it was like, oh, wait, we've got we've got something going here. And I think people are going to respond to this and they're responding to me. And then they didn't for a couple years. And I think part of that was because I didn't know how to audition. I camp was an open call that I went to. And so I was just learning on the fly. And so it, it took me a minute. And I remember moving to, to Harlem. My first apartment was in, was in West Harlem and eating like pasta with vodka sauce for breakfast. Cause that was the cheapest thing I could afford or, or like, or the sardines, you know? Oh yeah. And, yeah, and just taking voice <laughs> lessons and working at the Bubba Gump Shrimp Company in Times Square and, and auditioning like a madman and working crazy hours and, you know, walking home with your cash. And so you walk in the middle of the street because you don't want nobody fucking with you or fucking with your money because you got to pay that rent. <laughs> um, and so, so those years were, those years were interesting. It, it wasn't until I was 21. Camp was when I was 17. We, yeah. By the time we shot it, I turned 18. And I got to rent by the age of 21. And in retrospect, really three years isn't really, isn't much, but in the middle of it, it sure did feel intense. I imagine so. I, it's, I, I have to, I, I think about your character, Michael and Tick Tick Boom and the waking up at 5 a.m. to stand in line at equity and how real that felt. <laughs> and mm. so I, I feel like there had to be some, some, some close connection there and some something oh yeah I think I actually think though that the experiences that I was able to pull from were less so those early years and more so the years post La Caja fall where I wasn't working or where, where I was already a two-time Tony Award nominee mm-hmm. I thought the trajectory was only going to go up and then all of a sudden it like it wasn't aligning with the work that I wanted to do and I pumped the brakes for a while and, and I and I in my mind, I was, I was not taking work that I felt I wasn't suited for, wasn't suited to my mission statement in my work. And, but then after a while, you know, the money got low. And I remember having to move in with my brother and sister in Connecticut, like I, my, my sister that time, because it's happened more than once. And, and that was really humbling. And it was a navigation. I was just trying to, I'm playing, I've been playing the long game in this career. And that just meant that there were certain times that were gonna be less than ideal. And so that despair, by the time I got to my late twenties, I really debated leaving the business. I thought, at one point, I even thought Boys in the Band was gonna be my last gig, you know? Oh, I yeah. Just, yeah, I just thought, well, this is going well. Let's see what happens with Boys in the Band. If, if like something comes from, if something, another job comes from this, then great, then maybe I meant to stay. But if it doesn't, let's go out like this. Yeah. Um, I think it was the recent years. Thankfully, now I'm a committed actor. I'm in it for life. I'm devout. <laughs> I love it. I, you're you're my favorite kind of interview, Robin, because you are, you've answered like three questions I had like down the road, and I uh-huh. love that because you're just like a storyteller, and I'm 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 here for that. I appreciate that. I come from a family of storytellers. I love that. Um, 
let's let's get into tick tick boom a bit here. Uh, I was at the AFI premiere in November, where you were and everybody from the film was there, and I have to say it was one of the best movie going experiences I've ever had in my life. Hey! It, it was that audience was so on fire for everything. Mm. Was that your first time seeing it too? Then with anybody with an audience? Yeah, yeah. I, I I'd seen it at home with yeah. friends and my family. You know, I I I'd seen it in like a group of three and two here and there. Um. So a little backstory. Um, mm -hmm. If you were there that night, then you've heard me talk about just like my my mental health state during the making of, of yes. the movie. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And and you know I was in the middle of a major learning curve during that film and it was honestly when I look back on on it it was nothing but abundant blessings because I I needed to learn systemically certain things for my mental health and so leading up to to the movie I was sort of in a post-mortem as to everything I'd learned and one of the big things for me was that I I hadn't been present in in the early rehearsals of, of Tick Tick. Mm -hmm. And then that sort of accumulated to by the time we shot the first couple scenes, I was really anxious and having these mini panic attacks. And I would have these moments of just such clarity when I was acting in presence. And then my ego would come in and insert some sort of doubtful thought and it would distract me and it would throw everything off. And I felt like I was choosing crazy <laughs> and not to be disrespectful but I, I just I wasn't I wasn't choosing the healthiest thoughts and then I'd go back and and so the first couple of weeks were a little rough and I had this moment of clarity where I, I suddenly realized um that I was choosing fear and not love and and that mm -hmm. my ego was in conflict with my creativity and as someone in, in a position of such privilege to come from to have my family story the accumulation the work that they've done and to get to where I am and to choose to create problems when none exists felt so self-indulgent. And there was something about that that, that really did heal me. That I, didn't, I didn't approach it from a place of judgment so much as like, oh, my perspective's been off. And I'm going to choose one that amplifies love through my work. And, and that's, that's so, there's so much there. We could do a full episode on just that. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully you know what I mean. And 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 what that led to was I hadn't been present outside of life as much as I as much as I wanted to be. And the healing, like the deep, deep healing and perspective that Tick Tick gave me allowed me the rest of this year to to multiply that and, and to really figure out what I'm trying to center in my life and what I want to be intentional about. And for me. It's like, I, A, I want to be present in my personal life, and B, I want my work to, to this sounds so, so cheesy, but like, I want it to be a divine experience, the creating the work and what the work does, and I want it to be representative of, of the people that I come from, of like, working class Latinos and queer folks and folks that have been erased from narratives and that I, my existence allows them to be put back in, whether it's, you know, all of the elders that I never got to meet, the Latino folks that died of HIV that are now inserted in the 90s because of this movie. And then with Boys in the Band in 1968, we get inserted into that period that almost acted as if we didn't exist. And, and, and so then in all of that healing and figuring out, I was able to become more present to the point, and this is coming, I know it doesn't seem like it, but I'm getting back to your question. When I was in my car getting to the red carpet at AFI, the whole week we'd been talking, me and my publicist and my agent and, and uh, my stylist, and it's the first time I've ever been able to rattle off a list like that and have a team. <laughs> I'm feeling a lot of things and we're talking about the red carpet, but I wasn't like, I was so invested in the combo and, and just being present that when we got to the red carpet, I froze. Because even though we intellectually talked about the red carpet, it was different than physically seeing it. And in that moment, I became overwhelmed with emotion because I realized that I had been so present that I hadn't allowed myself to get stressed over the red carpet. I was like so in the here and the now 
that I was just so floored. At. And, and, and that's an experience that maybe I, I hadn't felt in a long time. And then when we walked through the press line, I didn't, I didn't understand how loved the movie was by the people that were interviewing me. And so this weird thing happened where I'm just, I have my talking points and the things that I want to like talk about, but then I'm looking at these interviewers and realizing, oh no, you're sincerely moved by this movie. Like, like the love that you're giving me on this red carpet over the, over the film is not fake. It's not, it's not produced. It's like these people were genuinely moved. So as I made my way through, I'm already just so floored in my personal journey of being able to receive this moment and be in it and enjoy it. And then I'm, I became overwhelmed by the fact like, oh shit, we have a hit movie. <laughs> we have a movie that people actually love. And, and, and as healing as it is for me personally, it's been healing for others. And I feel like only now that I'm catching up on rest, am I really able to absorb the full impact of it? Yeah, see, I don't think that's cheesy at all. I think it's oh. it's pretty incredible and something that can be translated to anybody, whether they are a performer or mm. work at a grocery store, whatever it might be, because you are you're always you're always having a battle with yourself of entitlement of things that you think you should have versus uh, things you don't think you deserve. Mm -hmm. And, and we're, all, we, we're all kind of having that battle. So I think people hearing this and listening to that, that story can be completely moved by it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank um, you. I talked to Andrew at AFI about what I thought was re is really one of the most important elements of this story. And that's the friendship between a gay man and a straight man and how pure it was. Mm. Can you talk a little bit about working with Andrew on this and how you developed that on-screen relationship? Yeah. yeah, you know, it's one of the things I'm most proud of in the movie because I feel like in this industry, we, we know straight dudes and gay dudes that are friends. We, mm -hmm. we, we, we see that, but we've never seen it on a platform. We've never seen it modeled for kids because I feel like that's, that's something that's very specific to theater folks or to people in this industry. I think more so in theater even than film, but, but I could be lying actually about that. <laughs> um, the thing with the storyline between Michael and Jonathan on paper read so beautifully, like Stephen did his thing writing our, in our screenplay. And, but when we got to do table work, and we sifted through, it was like, we discovered so much more that Stephen had put in there that for whatever reason, we didn't catch. And Stephen Levinson, by the way, I should have said his full name. And, and one day after rehearsal with Lynn, I think this was like the second or third day of table work, Andrew and I were just sort of like, whoa, there's so much here. There's so much density. And we got, we're, we can't wait to find the rest of the beats. And he took a deep breath and he said, wow, so this is, this is a real love story here. Meaning the love story between Michael and Jonathan, because it's so easy to center the romantic love story, but there's this other one too. And there's something about labeling it a love story that just elevates it and gives it, gives it more. And, and, they, and that really did, did change things. I, what's cool about Andrew and what I love, I, I'm someone who was coming in like, I'm going to watch this dude because I want to learn. I want to figure this out. I want to I want to know if there's something special or unique to being a movie star and, and what do I need to, to get to that level? And really what it was was hard work. Like you look at Andrew's script and there's notes everywhere. You know, he's he's a studious person. You you mention a random musical theater song and he's going to go listen to the song that night. And by the next week, you're, he's going to like be humming it. You're like, wait, are you singing that song? Oh, yeah, I went home and I listened to the song you said. Um, and so it was cute. We'd have these little fun, little like games to get to know each other. And, and Andrew's also someone who does have, who, who has queer friends and he, there's, he's so not homophobic. You know what I mean? Like he's just lovey dovey. And 
it allowed an openness between us, a comfort. There wasn't, there was never any hesitation as to like the intimacy that we had in the scenes. It just happened naturally to the point where even Lynn one day said, ooh, do that thing you did in the last take where you hold his face again or like kiss him on the cheek. Like I do, please do that. Lynn, Lynn, if anything, encouraged him more because he knows it. But the last thing I'll say regarding this is, what was, what was so cool about working with Andrew was that he and I are both, you know, mystics. And we believe in inviting spirit into our work. And one of the things that was really cool about working with him and, and both of us being so present was that there were these moments where I truly feel like Jonathan entered the room. There were these moments in certain scenes where we felt there was a presence in the room, your hair stand up. And Andrew and I never had to say anything. We just looked each other in the eyes and we knew that the other one knew that magic was happening and we were just going to stay doing our job, you know, to not get in the way of that thing. But yo, it was there. <laughs> <laughs> and that was really cool to be at the place with another person where you're so open that you can share that experience. It definitely comes across that way. And, and, <clears throat> and what I was extremely impressed with, and, and it does, you're, you're right. There is a legacy to this story and, and to this film that, that just hovers around like an aura yes. throughout the whole thing. Yes, yes, I affirm that, I affirm that. I mean, I will say Jonathan Larson's spirit it was ever present and I, on insecure days, I, I listened to Elizabeth Gilbert who sometimes is a guru for me and, and I would, I'd get up, I'd prepare myself and if I still for whatever reason felt like I wasn't, in the space that I wanted to be in before we shot a specific scene, I'd go, yo, Jonathan, yo, like, I just want the record to show that I showed up. So if you want this to be good, I would appreciate it if you showed up because <laughs> I might not be able to do this one alone. So uh, hope you show up today. <laughs> and I think he did. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he did. Thank you. Thank you. Um, ex indeed. I wanted to ask about, there's right now so much conversation about representation in media and art that's finally kind of getting its due. And you mentioned as a queer Latino person and choices that you make, how do you define representation and what does it mean to you? Mm -hmm. Ooh, I've never heard it. How do you define representation and what does it mean to you? I mean, at the end of the day, it's about equity and, and, and safety for me and, and equal opportunity. And so when I talk about being a queer actor and queer representation, I'm not saying that I don't want to play straight roles. Mm -hmm. So I'm very aware that, it's, that it doesn't fully make sense for me to say blanket statement, straight man can't play gay. But I'm just saying you can't play, you should not be prioritizing gay roles right now. What I'm saying is we're at a deficit. We're in the pink and there is not enough representation of out gay actors playing out gay roles. And when you go back further than that and you go to the audition, not even, the, not even booking the job, who's getting the opportunity to audition, a lot of gay actors, once someone knows that they're out or if they're an actor that predominantly presents in an effeminate way, there's an assumption made that you are limited. And so sometimes you don't even get to audition for the role. And then you have this love of like uh, these like elite straight actors who are like, you know what, I'm trying to get an award. Let me go play that gay part. Or I've never played gay before. That'll be fun. Let me do this. And there's no consideration to, hey, wait, how about instead of my personal interest in getting to do this thing and push my skills, how about I actually give the people that are of that community you know, a chance first, and then afterwards I can step in if, if need be. Um, with Ryan Murphy, you know, I think it, it can get nuanced because he also allows gay actors to play straight. So I, I hate to say this, but I, I do sort of sometimes apply different rules to different situations. Um, God, I hope I'm not getting myself in. No, I think I thing. think that's okay because I'm totally with you. I I think I think the rules for for us and I'll say us uh, are a little different because the rules have always been made for us before. 
Yes. And when it comes <laughs> and when it comes to like trans roles, I'm like, y'all get out the way. <laughs> like <laughs> it's 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 weird to me that a person would want to represent a demographic visually, but not systemically. Mm -hmm. Like there's something so incredibly hypocritical about that. And, and, and that's what's infuriating. And sometimes I'll say, listen, if you're a person who for whatever reason has represented a demographic that is not yours consistently or significantly, then you know what? Do me a favor, make a donation, participate with that community, show up so that I, at, at least I know that you're giving back from who you took from. Otherwise, I, I, it feels yeah. too colonizery. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I think you, you, met, you mentioned Ryan Murphy, which I thought was perfect because I was thinking about that too mm -hmm. and how, how he and, and Stephen Canals and uh, Our Lady J and Janet Mock created Pose with such specific intention. And then you, you, you completely nail it with walking into, you know, a casting agency or an audition. And that's where, you know, somebody's career can begin or end. And it's, it's not always at the top tier, you know, where we see, yeah. you know, a straight actor playing a gay role, you see it at that level. So that's your, I think you're can absolutely I right. More into that though. Uh, yeah. May I, there's also another side to it, which is like, as queer actors, we're seen as so limited before we're given the opportunity to prove otherwise. Mm -hmm. I remember years ago, a, a casting director told my best friend, um, he didn't know this casting director that, that my best friend was my best friend. And he said, um, this, this was for a gay role, but it was a very subtle nuanced character. And this casting director said, Robin only, only plays over the top femme queens. He can't do this having never given me the opportunity. Mm -hmm. and, and I just thought it was interesting because that person had never seen me attempt to do anything otherwise. It's just that that's what they had seen. So they had reduced me. And I'm very interested in, in my career being a little more disruptory as to what we think of a, of a queer actor as being. A queer actor who's out presents effeminately and I'm not talking about like these these like gay dudes who are mad butch and make straight people feel safe I wish them the best I'm just saying to someone who when you meet me you pr you pretty much know I'm gay <laughs> how about that mm -hmm. and so with an actor like me I want to show that I can present this way and still give you a, a career that is predominantly queer work and still has range yes. because because if a straight actor is never doubted for never having played gay and only played straight, why am I being held to a standard that says, I'm not good, I'm not legitimate until I can successfully play butch straight? Exactly. And so that's, and I feel like every single demographic has something like that, some parallel. And so that's the other side that I, I hope that we can disrupt more and more in terms of conversations about race. And then the last thing I'll say, and I promise I'll shut up, is the institutions are attempting, white supremacy is, is masking in many ways. And one of the ways that it's presenting itself is by causing in-house fighting between people of color. You know, this whole thing of agents calling their non-Black POC clients and saying, um, sorry, they, they, they wanted ethnic, but they went black or, or telling white folks, oh, by the way, black is ethnic. Obviously what I, what I mean is that certain within communities of color, they're being told that black folks are being prioritized and it's a way of creating in-house fighting. It's a way of getting non-black POC folks to be jealous or envious of the black community when they've been established here longer, <laughs> you know? And, but then the other side is you're getting white actors being told that they're not booking work because casting went POC and not clocking that that is planting a seed of racism, that there's, there's the white supremacy in that. That's, that's the other aspect I just wanted to touch on. Absolutely, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And to, to, that, to that point about playing roles, 
do you have a dream role that you want to mm. play? Yes, fun things. <laughs> um, <laughs> I do. I want to play the baker in Into the Woods. I ah, play, yes. Yeah, I want to play Freddy and Dirty Ron Scoundrels. Oh um, I actually, I think there's a world <laughs> where Dog Day Afternoon gets a reboot. You know, a remake. Did mm -hmm. you say theater specifically? Anything, anything. Anything. Because you've Dog done Day everything. <laughs> Thank you. Dog Day Afternoon is something that when I look back at that film and the way Sidney Lamette handled the, the, the trans character specifically, in, in, in certain ways, it was handled better than a lot of folks handle trans issues now. Or trans, Absolutely. I don't even want to say trans issues because that feels like trans characters and character development. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and so I feel like there's a world now in which we go back to that film with a modern eye and, and just bring out more. I love that. Yeah. And I, 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 I did read something you had mentioned, uh, you're in town and, and, and Bobby Strong. So I, I feel oh, like Bobby Strong. Yeah. Yeah. Bobby Strong <laughs> and, George, and George in Sunday in the Park with George is, is another one. I love it. Yeah. 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 But the, also the, like the number, number one thing I want to do, my best friend, Dominic Colon, I always give him love. Amazing playwright, screenplay writer, uh, screenwriter. Um, he has a play called the war I know that we're hopefully gonna workshop this coming year. Um, and it is, you know, it is a story centering black and brown folks in the Bronx during the crack and AIDS ap epidemic. It's, it's centering them in the AIDS epidemic and it's a trilogy and it's, it's a way to just like, it's commentary on so many things, but it's also commentary on the fact that like our people have never been centered in HIV stories as well. Love yeah. it. Oh my God. Well, we got to make that happen then. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. Uh, Robin, thank you so much for talking with me today. Are we already at the today. end? Go wait. Yeah. I, I oh gotta, my God. <laughs> I mean, I, I could go into multiple volumes. We could break this down. Yes. Thank you. No. Well, I will say this only because I did get heavy there. I'm yes. Just wanna, I would love to add yes. um, that, you know, in these times right now where everything feels so muddy and heavy, that I, I would, one of the things that I think about oftentimes is like how lucky we are to be a part of an age that is full of such change and such consciousness. And that I know that things can feel dreary, but also what a blessing it is to participate in a generation that wants to acknowledge a collective consciousness and a collective just betterment for all. And so I hope that when we find ourselves feeling incredibly oppressed, we can also just choose to affirm the, the blessings that we get to participate. Love that. That's a really beautiful thought. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Take care, Eric. All Have best. a great holiday. You too. Bye.